Well, good morning. The context of the verses that we read is that Solomon had finished building the temple. There had been a time of amazing celebration, praise, worship and prayer. And fire from heaven had fallen and consumed the sacrifice on the altar. The glory of the Lord had filled the temple. Wouldn't you love to have been there? One night the Lord appeared to Solomon. And the Lord was pleased with uh, what, he, what had been done. But the Lord knew that his chosen people were, were prone to wander off and sin. So God warned Solomon that if they did, drought and famine would ravish the country. And locusts would consume what little crops were left. Disaster. But God in his mercy went on to say that if that happened, there would be just one way back. But there were four things that the people would need to do. They'd need to humble themselves, and we looked at that last time, to pray, to seek God's face and to, to turn from their wicked ways. And last time I spoke, we looked at the need for us to humble ourselves before God, recognising that the work of the Holy Spirit, and unless he works, we have nothing to offer and no ability to do anything for God's kingdom that will impact lives in this community. And if you look at much of the church in this country, you'll, you'll see that we, we live in a time of spiritual drought and famine. So in the second part of the short series, I, I want to speak about prayer. And then even as I mentioned the word prayer, I, I, I sense I can hear the internal groans and sighs. Oh, Perhaps you're thinking, oh no, no, not another lecture on the fact that we need to pray more. Well, let's all go on a guilt trip because we know we could pray more and probably should pray more. Well, I hope and pray that this will not be a guilt trip, but instead with the help of the Holy Spirit, we'll all be encouraged to pray. Not because we should, not because we must, but because you and I are part of the blessed family of God, who may. So why is it that our prayer meetings are generally the worst attended? There's wonderful examples of prayer in the Bible. And as we look at some of them, I, I pray that you and I will be encouraged to pray. Ephesians 3.20 says he's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. John 15.7 says if you, arraign, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. James 5.17 says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And our righteousness, of course, is found in Jesus. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it wouldn't rain and it didn't rain on the land for three and a half years. And at the end of that period, he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the, the earth produced its crops. What you see when you look at Elijah is a man of faith who prayed and prayed until he got the answer. And in a time of serious drought and famine, Elijah says to King Ahab, Go, eat and drink, for there is the sound of a heavy rain. <laughs> if you'd have looked around, you wouldn't have seen a cloud in the sky. But Ahab went off to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel and he bent down to the ground, put his face between his knees and said to his servant, go, go and have a look and see. And he went up and he looked and he came back. There's nothing there. Go again, said Elijah. Go back. And go back and go back. And on the seventh time, the servant came back and he said, oh, he, master, he said, I can see a cloud as small as a man's hand. But Elijah knew if God was in it, rain was on the way. And as we read through the Bible, we discover that prayer is both private and public. I 
that's how Jesus prayed. And Jesus taught us how not to pray. He said, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites, for they just love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners just to be seen by others. And Jesus says, truly, I tell you, they've received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, don't keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Isn't that encouraging? And what Jesus was doing was giving us a warning. This wasn't Jesus saying that the only right place to pray is alone with the door shut. Jesus prayed both privately and publicly, so that should be our pattern too. Most of us will have heard many sermons over the years about the need to pray, about how to pray, when, what, where we should pray. Should we sit, should we stand, should we lie down and so on in order to pray, and the order in which we should pray and so on and so on. One church that I was uh, part of, did an experiment at their early morning prayer meeting and that they decided that they would pray laying down and they had to stop that because after just a few minutes it was clear that some were catching up on their 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 sleep jesus had the same problem with his disciples didn't he in the garden can i read you a poem i heard recently it's called the prayer of cyrus brown The proper way for men to pray, said Deacon Roger Keyes, the only proper attitude is down upon the knees. No, I should say the way to pray, said Reverend Dr Wise, standing straight with arms outstretched, with covered and upturned eyes. Oh, no, 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 said Elder Slow, such posture is too proud. A man should pray with eyes fast closed and head entirely bowed. Ha! I once fell into Hedgecombe's well. Head first, said Cyrus Brown, with both my heels a sticking up and my head a pointing down. I prayed a prayer right there and then, the best prayer I ever said. The most earnest prayer I ever prayed was standing on my head. I've told some of you that I met a pastor from Ukraine who used to get up early to pray each morning, but His problem was that he kept falling asleep even when he was praying, and I guess you and I have experienced that too. So what he did, he stood with his bare feet in a bowl of ice water. Jesus doesn't advise us that there's a particular posture. We find him kneeling, sitting, standing, and then praying whilst nailed to a cross in my place and your place. In Luke 18, we read that Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said there was a judge who didn't fear God, nor cared about what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Judge, grant me justice against my adversary. And for some time the judge refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this woman keeps bothering me, I'll see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come round and attack me. And Jesus said, listen to what the unjust judge says. But will God not bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? That's a real challenge to you and I this morning. You see, our Father is not some self-centred judge who thinks more of himself than the person who's asked for help. No, our Father knows what we need. And our prayers are for for wants often rather than needs. And not all our wants are part of God's plan for our lives. He wants us to ask and not give up. 
The Bible says he's more willing to give than we are to receive in order that his name will be honoured and praised. And I believe that our prayer life, first of all, is linked to our personal relationship with Jesus. Some years ago, I, I seemed to be working overseas almost as much as in the UK. And time dragged when I was away, especially if it was more than just a few days. Because I longed to be in the presence and talking with those that I loved. Isn't that how our prayer life should be? I think that the first question perhaps we need to ask ourselves this morning is, how is our relationship with our Father in heaven? Do we long to be in his presence? You see, true prayer brings us into the presence of a Father who loves us, has chosen us and adopted us into his family. Of course, sometimes we get discouraged when the answer doesn't come right away. But faith can overcome that problem. And Jesus taught his disciples to pray and never give up. And our faith, our faith needs to be firm on God's word so that our prayers seek God's will and ultimate honour. And then we don't need to be discouraged by a delay in the answer. Do you remember the account of King David? He'd been called to lead God's people. And one day he was at home when, in fact, he should have been at war with his troops. And he saw a neighbour's wife sunbathing and the desire of his heart led him into sin. And he arranged for her husband to be killed in battle in spite of him fighting on King David's side. And his love affair with this woman resulted in her becoming pregnant and giving birth to a son. The child became seriously ill. And David was distraught. He took off his royal robes, the Bible said. He dressed in sackcloth and he laid on the floor and he fasted and prayed for seven days. But in spite of his prayers and fasting, the, the, the child died. And David's response was this. He got up, he washed and went into the temple and worshipped God. And his attendants were, were a bit confused about this. And they said, why are you acting this way, sir? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept, but now the child is dead. You, you get up and eat. And David answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and I wept. And I thought, who knows, the Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he's dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him one day but he will not return to me. And in God's forgiveness and mercy, David accepted God's will. Well, we don't always get what we want, but true faith accepts what God wants for our lives. The Bible tells us that Daniel, whilst he was exiled in Babylon, he humbled himself, he prayed and fasted, asking that God's people would be freed from exile so they could return to their own land. In the immediate time frame, he, he didn't see anything happen. But his prayers had been heard and help was on the way. Amazing help was on its way. King Darius is overthrown and, as, and Cyrus, a pagan king of Persia, began to rule over Babylon. And in the first year of his reign, his heart was moved by God to make a public announcement that God's people in exile could return to Jerusalem and more than that this pagan king Cyrus would provide the materials and resources they needed be encouraged to pray because he is able to do more abundantly than we can ask or imagine as a lovely account in the bible of how the king of Aram kept attacking the king of Israel and things were not going so well for the king of Aram so he called his officers together. Actually, he suspected that there was a traitor in their ranks. And one of his officers spoke up and he said, uh, Your Majesty, the problem is not with us. It's Elisha the prophet. He tells the king of Israel even the words you speak in your bedroom. So the king of Aram sent men to capture 
Elisha. They discovered that he was in Dothan, so at night they went and they surrounded the city. And when the servant of Elisha got up and went out early in the morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, he cries, what shall we do? Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. If God be for us, who can be against us? And Elisha prayed, Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And then the Lord opened the servant's eyes. And now from a godly perspective, he looked and he saw the hills full of heaven's horses and chariots and a fire all around. Now we need to pray that we will see things as God sees them. That will help transform our prayers, won't it? And as the enemy came down towards him, Elisha prayed again to the Lord, strike this army, Lord, with blindness. So God struck them with blindness, just as Elisha had asked. And Elisha called to the invading army, hey, gang, follow me and I'll lead you to the man that you're looking for. And he led them to Samaria. And after they entered the city, Elisha prayed, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. And then the Lord opened their eyes and, and they looked and there they were inside Samaria. This was the last place they wanted to be. And when the king of Israel saw them, he suggested that they should all be slaughtered. But Elisha said, no, 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 prepare a great feast for them. And after they finished eating and drinking, send them back where they came from. And the Bible says that after this, the forces from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. See, God's plan so much better than our plans. Be encouraged. He's able to do more abundantly than you can ask or imagine. And the reason that some in our families don't seek after Jesus is this. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. How about we pray like Elisha? Lord, open the eyes of these loved ones so they can see. And I pray that God will open our eyes to see the battle we're in over the souls of this community and beyond. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. General Boykin was a, a Christian who trained the United States Green Berries, similar to our SAS, I guess. He was a committed Christian and a very spiritually sensitive man. And one day he delivered a really moving message to a hundred faith evangelism trainees at the base in North Carolina. He, he revealed to them something really interesting about the war in Afghanistan. He says, at the beginning of the war, we flew three squads of 12 Green Berets into Afghanistan in helicopters. They were armed with light rifles and 9mm pistols. They also had radios and the captain had a laser target designator. And when they went out to meet the warlord who commanded the Northern Alliance, it was very obvious to everyone that the warlord was a bit confused. When he saw only a handful of Americans with light weapons. This is not enough. And the captain asked him what was keeping him from Cockburn. And the warlord pointed to the hills across the way and he said, the Taliban. And he looked as if to ask, what do you think you can do with just a few men? And perhaps we could ask the same question as we look over this community and long to pray for a change. The captain asked how long he'd been holed up there. And he was told they'd been there for three years, three and a half years, in fact. 
And again, he looked as though he couldn't believe America had sent such a token force. And the captain said to him, sir, he said, point out a target and stand back and watch. And he did. And the captain aimed the laser target designator at the target. And in a few minutes, missiles began coming over the mountain. And for two and a half weeks, this onslaught continued until the Taliban was smashed. In two and a half weeks, just 36 men mobilised a force of thousands. And General Boykin explained that these green berries, they didn't have the power to do that. They only had light rifles and nine millimetre pistols. But these men were force multipliers who had power behind them that they could call in to accomplish the objective. And the ger general went on to explain that, that we're in a spiritual war and we need force multipliers to win the battle. He says, on your own, you cannot defeat the enemy, but you can call on a force who can. One man on his knees with the Holy Spirit is more powerful than a battleship. And he said, 10 men with the Holy Spirit can take back your city. And a hundred men with the Holy Spirit can take back your state. You see, you and I on our own, we don't have the power to win spiritual battles. But we have the power of the living God behind us and with us. And that power is the Holy Spirit. And humility recognises that fact and yields to him. But it means a commitment to our Heavenly Father. An obedience to Jesus and surrender to the Holy Spirit. Jesus taught his disciples to pray and he teaches that we ought always to pray and never give up. He wants to be our provider. He wants us to be dependent on him, to trust him implicitly for all our needs because he alone knows what is best for us. Our God is able. His power is not diminished with time. If my people will humble themselves and pray. Friends, I believe that God is, is calling us to be serious in our praying and to recognise that without a move of God in this community, things will not change. But we can pray and with heaven's forces behind us, we can see the kingdom of God come in this community. Amen. Amen. Our 
sorrow share Jesus knows our every weakness Take it to the Lord in prayer Despise, forsake thee. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find us all this there. Well, we've come to the end of our service today and it's time for our last of the September post-service snacks. Diet starts 1st of October. But we're going out in style because it's Will, our cameraman, our light and sound engineer, our chief editor. It's Will's 18th birthday today. So happy birthday, Will. And we've got you a very special birthday cake. I'm going to just hold it there. Fantastic. Well, I'll give you that in a moment. But... Before we have cake, it wouldn't embarrass you too much publicly if your dad sings happy birthday to you, would it? Great. Happy birthday you. There, that wasn't too bad, was it? Well, thank you so much for being with us today. I want to say a special thank you to Bernard and to Tina and to Richard. Thank you to Sean and thank you always to Will for all that you do for us. We really appreciate all your camera work, all your editing skills and all that you've done for us over the past few months especially. Well, we're going to close with God's word and then we'll pray together the words of the grace. Some words from Romans chapter 15 and verse 13. May the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we think of one another, let's say the words of the grace. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forevermore. Amen.